Good morning, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. So today I want to talk about white flight. This idea that where people move to is motivated by their ideas about ethnicity and the ethnic character of neighbourhoods. If I speak further into this, is that better? So, I want to make three arguments today. And the first one is that spatial patterns matter. So the spatial inequalities are important for us to look at as well as the social inequalities. And particularly the idea of spatial polarisation. Secondly, there's a need for evidence of the processes of population change, not just the patterns of population change. And I'm going to argue, really, that all the debates about segregation, about white flight, are stuck in talking about the patterns. And thirdly, I want to make the argument linked to these first two arguments for a need for small area data, particularly census data, which, as I'm sure you know, is under threat. So my starting point is white flight and this idea that the distribution of people in terms of ethnicity is driven by ethnically motivated migration. And this is an enduring notion. We saw debates about this after the 2001 census data came out. We saw it last year, as we see in these headlines, after some of the population data by ethnicity came out from the 2011 census. And it's still ongoing. There was a Demos event at Parliament last week where this featured as one of the points of discussion. And in some ways, I'm glad to see this. I'm glad to see that there are debates about the processes of population change, not just about the patterns of segregation. But I haven't seen convincing evidence that white flight is happening. And that's partly because the census data from 2011 that would allow us to look at the process, the patterns of population change, patterns of migration by ethnic group for subnational areas of England and Wales or the UK have not been published yet. They'll be out in a few months' time, we hope. So we don't have that evidence on the pattern to inform these discussions about the meaning and the process of ethnically differentiated migration. So I think there are a number of reasons why we can be sceptical about claims of white flight. And the first one is that we've seen for the 2000s, as well as for the 1990s, that ethnic mixing residentially has increased. So whatever the motivations of people's migrations, the patterns that we see are increased ethnic mixing in our neighbourhoods, including for very, very small levels of geography, which are shown here in maps produced by Gemma Catney, which are part of a series of briefings produced by CODE um, and the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, which are all available at ethnicity.ac.uk. And what Gemma shows here is the change in segregation for areas within districts um, between 90, 2001 and 2011. And you can see that the purple areas in these maps show a decrease in residential segregation within districts. And the key point to take here from these maps for Chinese and Indian is that most of England and Wales is purple. There is decrease in residential segregation at these very, very small scales. There's also increased residential mixing in households. I think it's one in eight or one in nine of households with more than one person. Now it's constituted by people of more than one ethnic group. Think of that, one in eight households. Think of your street or your apartment block. One in eight is now mixed ethnicity households. And in relationship, the fastest growing ethnic group, minority group, is the mixed group, which by most people's definition, is a result of relationships between people of different ethnicities. So we see ethnic mixing. Another reason to be sceptical about white flight claims is that past evidence suggests that migration patterns are not ethnically motivated or ethnically driven. So, for example, this is 
data from the 2001 census, and it shows the net migration rates for each of these minority groups from the areas in which these groups are concentrated and the net migration of the white population from areas in which these groups are concentrated. So, for example, um, between 2000 and 2001, there was a net movement of Indians out of Indian concentrations and a net movement of whites out of Indian concentrations. We see the same for the Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups, same for the Chinese group. We actually see minority movement out of black concentrations and white movement in, which I think links to conversations that have already been had about changing housing structure and gentrification and such like. So we have this evidence, which we see also if we look at smaller scales, and we see in data from 1991, that there is common dispersal from urban areas where minorities are concentrated to elsewhere. The third reason to be sceptical about white flight claims is that although I don't um, dismiss the idea that ethnicity matters in understanding migration patterns around Britain, it matters in ways other than can be called ethnic conflict interpretations. So I want to spend most of the rest of this talk looking at some of these alternative interpretations of white flight. <coughs> the first reason is to do with demographics. So it's been argued that this white flight can also be seen as counter-urbanisation, a very well documented and long-standing trend in most of the developed world for populations to move out of urban cores in a cascade towards more rural areas to do with li lifestyle aspirations largely and family and household change. And it's because of this it tends to be families, particularly families in the, the latter stages of maturity, so with older children and older people without children who are moving to these rural areas. That's how counter-urbanisation has commonly been defined. We can see from this population pyramid, which shows the proportion of people in each age group for males and females, for the Bangladeshi population in the grey bars and the white population in the red outlined bars, that the Bangladeshi population has far higher proportions of their population in the younger age groups, whereas the white population of England and Wales is much more stable and ageing, actually. So if it's the older people who are moving out of urban cores, we'd expect to see that more from the white population than from the Bangladeshi population, purely as a result of their population structure. Secondly, how much money have influences where you can live? And socioeconomic inequalities are well documented between ethnic groups. And this is one example, again, from the Code and JRF briefings. And this shows um, inequalities in employment between ethnic groups. And if we look at the far right-hand side of each of these bars in the orange, this shows the proportion for each ethnic group where one bar represents an ethnic group, and the proportion who is unemployed in 2011. And the key point from this is the range of this. So we see at the very top, the other white group, 4% of that group is unemployed in 2011 compared to 20% of the other black group. So if 20% of the other black group is unemployed, that is going to have real implications for their options in the housing market, which in turn has implications for where they might be able to choose to live. If you have a precarious or low income, you have less choice about where you can live. And these inequalities have a spatial dimension. This is a table from work we're currently doing with the Runnymede Trust, looking at the inequalities within districts for ethnic groups. And this is one summary table, again, to do with employment. So percent unemployment um, here shown for whites and minorities taken altogether. And this shows the top 10 districts in England and Wales, 
where there is greatest ethnic inequality in employment terms from 2011 census data. So Hackney, Lambeth, Tower Hamlets, Sheffield, Barnsley, these are the places where differences between mites and minorities in unemployment are greatest. So in Hackney, around 5% of whites over the age of 25 are unemployed compared to 15% of minorities in Hackney. So even within that district, the opportunities for these two different groups are going to be very different because one is in a very different employment situation from another. And linked to this is housing inequalities. So socioeconomic inequalities are bound up with housing inequalities. <clears throat> and as we've heard already today, one of the big changes over the last decade has been the rise in the private rental sector. And this has affected ethnic groups differently. So some ethnic groups have seen a disproportionate rise in private renting compared to others. And this will affect your residential mobility, the sector that you're in. It's not quite clear exactly how that might be. Maybe you will move more if you're in private rented, but perhaps you'll have less choice about where you can go or you'll be more insecure in that situation. And we can see here that there are major differences between ethnic groups in terms of levels of private renting in 2011. So the, the map on the left-hand side is white British, Caribbean in the middle, and other whites at the right-hand side who have very, very high levels of private renting. So the, the darkish red colours are 50% uh, or more private renting within those districts. So this is the common housing experience of these minority groups and these recent migrant groups. Another aspect of the housing market that affects where people live is discrimination. And we saw reports last autumn from a BBC Inside Out investigation that claimed that there was discrimination particularly against black tenants or potential black tenants in the private rented sector, which is particularly worrying given what we've just seen about the rise in the private rental sector, particularly for some minority groups. We've analysed the citizenship survey to look at people's perceptions of discrimination by different housing providers. And this chart uses the citizenship survey to show the likelihood, uh, the question asks the likelihood of you feeling that you will be treated worse by a private renting landlord um, than other races. So it's about people's sense of, will I be treated differently because of my race or ethnicity? And the chart here shows the likelihood of these ethnic groups feeling that they were more, li feeling more likely than whites to feel that the landlord will treat them worse than other races. So the, the bars show whether these groups were more likely than whites to feel that the landlords would treat them worse than other races. So as an example, the black group here was far more likely than the white group to feel that they would be treated worse than other races by private rented landlords. So they felt that they would be discriminated against in the private rented sector. And that, we could suggest, will affect their decisions about where they might move, the types of landlords they might seek out, the types of areas which they might feel they can move into or they have a choice to move into. The final alternative explanation that I want to suggest that can contrast with white flight interpretations is about neighbourhood belonging, which affects migration decisions about whether to move, where to move, if you actually want to stay where you are. And we found, again with analysis from the citizenship survey, that belonging to neighbourhood varies between ethnic groups. And that's what's shown here on this chart, the probability of feeling very strong neighbourhood belonging. We can see that there's a, there's a difference here, for example, between the likelihood of feeling resi residential belonging, neighbourhood belonging, um, in a strong way for whites and for Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups. So these minority Asian groups are more likely to feel attached to their neighbourhood. And actually, this finding is even stronger 
in neighborhoods where these groups are concentrated. So in areas where there are more Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, in fact, Pakistanis have a greater likelihood of feeling very strong neighborhood belonging. Now, some of you may play devil's advocate and suggest to me that, well, isn't this kind of playing into the idea of white flight? But alternatively, we could suggest that the desire to stay where you are, this neighborhood belonging, is really a very good example of what has been called community cohesion. So, to recap on my argument so far, um, white flight interpretations of migration claim Britain is pulling apart along lines of ethnicity as demonstrated by these migration patterns. But I'm skeptical about this because residential segregation is decreasing, because past evidence is quite compelling about residential moves that represent dispersal from minority concentrations. And because I think ethnicity matters in migration decisions and therefore in migration patterns in ways other than ethnic conflict. And I've suggested four alternative interpretations to white flight. Firstly, to do with the demographic differences between ethnic groups, particularly that minority groups tend to be younger, so perhaps more likely, therefore, to stay in urban centres. Secondly, that socioeconomic inequalities, not only in employment, as we've seen, but also in housing, affect where we can live, where we are able to look to, to buy a house or to rent a house. Thirdly, there is suggestion of discrimination in housing markets, which will certainly affect where people of different ethnic groups live. And further to that, there is evidence of perception of being discriminated against, which will affect people's migration decisions. And finally, neighborhood belonging differs between ethnic groups and will therefore affect people's migration patterns. And now what I'm really looking forward to, I know along with several people in this room, is the forthcoming census data on migration within England and Wales, within the UK, that will allow us to look at the origins and destinations of moves and to repeat some of the analysis that we saw for 2001. But what I think we really need to bear in mind in getting hold of this data later in the summer is that we have to think not only about the patterns that this shows, but what processes underlie these, what processes can we evidence with this census data, and think about the meaning of that as well as just the patterns. And much of what I've presented today has actually come from census data. All of, all of these and more of the slides actually come from census data. But this census data is under threat, as those of you who were at this conference last year will have heard Danny Dorling speaking about. And this is particularly concerning for people who are interested in ethnicity and people who are interested in neighbourhood. Because with the, the wonderful surveys that we have in this country, we still cannot get at those small groups with reliability and we cannot get at the small areas and what's happening in those. So the loss of the census is particularly important for people interested in neighbourhood, interested in spatial inequalities and interested in minority groups. So at the moment, the Office for National Statistics are reviewing the responses to their consultation about proposed alternatives to the census, and they will soon be making their recommendations to the UK Statistics Authority. And it's then the job of the UK Statistics Authority to make a recommendation to Parliament. So there's still chance for voices to be heard to say, yes or no, we think this recommendation is going to meet our needs and we can show how it will or how it won't meet those needs for the kinds of analysis, for example, that I've been showing today. And you can, you can follow this link if you're interested in following people who have been trying to express concern for the potential loss of neighbourhood and ethnicity data. So, to conclude, in considering whether Britain is pulling apart, we need to think about the spatial perspective as well as the social one. And describing the patterns of migration and local population chains is absolutely essential 
but it's not enough for engaging with these very political and very politicized debates. Because these ideas and these patterns can very easily be misinterpreted if evidence is not also presented on the processes and the meanings of the population change. So I hope I've illustrated that patterns described of white flight might alternatively be interpreted in terms of demographics, in terms of socioeconomic inequalities, in terms of discrimination, in terms of ideas of belonging and attachment. And this spatial perspective really requires very, very special data that we're really very privileged to have had and to have in the UK. Um, so there's a need for us to really make this case when ONS makes his recommendations very soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>